Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Today's topic, the Christian's armor. The Christian life is discussed in the New Testament under the concept of spiritual warfare. Satan and his wicked agents are presented as our unseen but very real enemy. He attacks believers, especially against their minds, their thought processes. God has made provision for his people to be protected. And this is the purpose of Paul's exhortation that we take up the armor of God and stand against the devil, found in Ephesians chapter 6. There are six pieces to the armor of defense that God has given the believer. Three parts fit on the body itself, the girdle or belt, the breastplate, and the shoes. A soldier is always clothed in these items. The other items are equipment that the soldier picks up and uses for immediate combat purposes. So when the trumpet calls, he takes up his shield, puts on his helmet, and takes a sword in hand to go forth and defeat the enemy. Each of these pieces of armor has a symbolic meaning. They stand for gospel realities, for gospel ideas. God's armor is defined as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the armor as he works for us is understood and as his work is appropriated by faith at each point of need. God's soldier is instructed to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm then, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Stand therefore, Holman Christian Standard Bible, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. Let's consider three items. The girdle. Now the girdle about the loins also functioned as a belt that gathered the loose ends of a soldier's garments and formed a sort of binder. The girdle kept everything in place and freed the soldier to fight. Paul says the girdle is truth. Now, truth here is something provided for us, which we put on. It is not subjective, but objective, something outside of us, which we put on. Our Lord Jesus says of himself, I am the truth. So it appears to be the whole truth of the gospel to which Paul refers. Our reception of the truth that is in Jesus Christ produces in us a life of reality and consistency of character. The faith is a term often used to designate the objective revelation of God. Thus, we are told to resist the devil steadfast in the faith. Quote, to gird up our loins with truth is to have a settled conviction with regards to the truth that is in Christ Jesus we can then combat Satan's lies with God's truth. Jesus defined himself as the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. The idea of absolute truth is inseparable from the life of Jesus Christ and from the Bible. Paul told the believers in Rome, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 13, 14, and Jesus himself prayed to the Father for us, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. The second piece of God's provided armor is the breastplate of righteousness. This item of clothing covered the soldier from his neck to his thighs. It functions as a protection for all the vital organs. Righteousness means to be right in God's eyes. The psalmist writes, Psalm 89, 14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Fred Zappel makes the following statement in an essay. The righteousness of God is the divine attribute that describes God as acting always in a way that is consistent with his own character. What righteousness does God require of us? God can require nothing less than perfect righteousness. Thomas Binney expressed this truth in his hymn, Eternal Light. Eternal light, eternal light, how pure the soul must be. 
when placed within your searching sight, it shrinks not, but with calm delight can face such majesty. Oh, how shall I, whose dwelling here is dark, whose mind is dim, before the face of God appear, and on my human spirit bear the uncreated being? The central attribute of God is holiness. Isaiah 57, 17 says of God that he is the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Isaiah heard the worship of heaven when he received his commission in Isaiah 6 in verse 3. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord that is Yahweh of hosts, The whole earth is full of his glory. And John had the same experience when he saw the vision of the heavenly throne when he was on the Isle of Patmos. The angels and all the hosts of heaven cry out to him, Holy, 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 Revelation 4a. As the Holy One, God requires absolute holiness and righteousness, and no person outside of Jesus the Messiah has such righteousness. But God, acting in his righteousness, provides this for us. Psalm 111 verse 9 says, He that he that is Yahweh God sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. In the words of Romans 3, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. We can never be good enough to stand before the holy God. What we need is the perfect righteousness of God. This is credited or imputed to us when we believe in Jesus Christ. Now God looks at me clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. He pronounces me a good, just, righteous, and holy man. No longer can the law condemn me because my debt has been paid by the Savior, nor can the accusations of the devil touch me. What does God provide that keeps us safe from the fiery darts of the wicked men? The breastplate of righteousness. It refers to the righteousness purchased for us by Jesus Christ at the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness, which is the perfect holiness of Christ, comes from God alone. This breastplate protects our vital organs spiritually. Our only true protection from Satan is what Christ has done for us and what he is in us. Let me repeat that. Our only true protection from Satan is what Christ has done for us and what he is in us. Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf wrote in one of my favorite hymns, Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. There's a third piece of basic armor. It is the heavy sandals, or the equivalent of today's army boots. These special shoes allow for good traction and endurance in marching and fighting. Prepared footwear spells readiness. Paul says our feet must be shod or shoed with the gospel of peace. Only then are we ready, equipped, and able to fight. Feet in scripture are often used as a symbol of the Christian walk, that is of the Christian activity, the Christian life. Thus the whole of life must be engaged in the spiritual conflict. These shoes are called shoes of the gospel of peace. The result of the gospel working in our hearts is an inner heart peace from God. The resulting conviction that we have been reconciled with God gives us courage and zeal to fight the good fight of faith. Listen to these scripture verses, what they say to us about feet in the gospel. From Isaiah 57 two, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. 
or Romans 10, 15. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. It's the broader context of the passage I previously quoted to you. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciles us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what is that message? That is, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 John 2, 6 says, The one who says that he resides in God ought himself to walk just as he walked. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, Walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And Colossians 1, 10, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Wow, you may not have thought about how much the scripture talks about your feet and about the gospel of peace. We are to fit our feet with the good news of peace. We are to advance on to the battle unafraid because we carry with us the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. An old adage states, the best defense is a good offense. You see, in spiritual battle, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to remind ourselves of the great truth of the gospel of God's peace, of the gospel of reconciliation, the gospel of the righteousness of Christ that is credited to our account. And we are clothed not in our own righteousness, but we are clothed in the righteousness of the perfect man and our only mediator, Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. God's church is sent to herald the good news of God's kingdom, which will spread his way of peace around the world. Having our shoes on, we're ready to move to spread these glad tidings to others. Recalling the words of Jesus, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. When a person becomes a Christian, he is automatically drafted into the army of the soldiers of Christ. But he's not only drafted, but he's also equipped with the spiritual weapons he needs to engage in holy combat for the glory of God in the advancement of the church in the world. That's part of the meaning of baptism found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, what we call the Great Commission, he came to his disciples and said to them, All power, all authority in heaven and earth has been granted unto me. He comes with the power of almighty sovereign God, for he is God and man, one person, two natures, our mediator, our commander-in-chief. And he says, as you go, as you go, preach the gospel. You're to preach and teach the truth of God's word so that people will come to faith in Jesus Christ and expressing that faith in the waters of baptism. They are then commissioned as soldiers in the army of God. That's who you are. That's who I am. Yes, I'm a child of God, but I'm also a soldier in God's army. Today, we've looked at the three pieces of equipment which fit on the body itself. The girdle or the belt, the breastplate, and the shoes. Next time, we'll look at three remaining pieces of spiritual armor which the Christian soldier takes up when the trumpet calls him to head for the battlefield. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. On to the fight, Christian soldier. 
your God supplies you with armor for protection and armor for victory. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights. The next time, keep fighting the battle. Remember the commander-in-chief has already won the victory. You walk in his victory.